Okay, we're going to be looking at some definitions that you'll need over the next couple weeks in the AP Stats class. Um, you'll need the document producing data notes that you either got in class or you downloaded from the assignment folder on Edline. Uh, first few terms are pretty basic, statistics. Um, basically it's collecting numbers about some sort of experiment or observation and we call this these numbers data. So statistics is just uh, the science of interpreting data. Data is obviously the numbers and the variables is whatever characteristic of a person or a thing that we're, can we can we count or express as a number of some kind. Sometimes it can be a mean, can be a median, could be a lot of different things that we're looking at. Two big terms that you need to make sure you become very familiar with is quantitative data versus categorical data. Quantitative data is numerical data in which finding the mean makes sense. Usually it's data where having something 0.5 makes sense. So for example, um, if I were to find what your a uh, average age is, age is uh, quantitative data because someone could be 3.5 years old or 29.6 years old, makes sense. Categorical data is data where we are counting something, taking an average doesn't make sense because you can't have 0.5 of number of people who said yes to a question. For example, classic one is the area code. Everyone knows Hawaii's area code is 808. It doesn't make sense to average the area code for Hawaii with the area code, say, of California and get, you know, 793.5. That doesn't make any sense. So even though that's a number, we would consider an area code categorical data. Uh, terminology that you need to become familiar with is what lurking variable, which is also known as a confounding variable. <clears throat> this is something that occurs in our experiment or in our data that may be influencing our data that we are not aware of. And we always got to be aware of those and always look for those, some sort of explanation, that, some sort of variable that may be influencing what our results are. One of the ways that statisticians get around dealing with lurking variables and confounding variables is to use random sampling. Uh, random sampling uses chance to help determine how you're going to collect your data, who's going to go into what group, etc. If you use chance to determine that, hopefully we'll balance out any confounding or lurking variables evenly or approximately evenly between your groups. And that way, if there is a difference between the two groups, you can associate it with whatever it is you're looking at rather than that compounding variable. The easiest one, and the one that we almost always recommend, is a simple random sample. Basically, that means that every person in, in the population has an equally chance of being selected in your uh, sample. Okay, A simple random sample is by far the best. It's not always doable, but it is the, the um, ideal type of sampling that you want to do in any kind of experiment or observation. Um, we can use calculators or computers, however, those aren't truly random. So sometimes they encourage you to use a table of random digits. I'm going to show you how to use that. Basically, when you use a table of random digits, um, you will look at a table. If you look at table B in your book when you get it, um, in the back of the book you'll see a table of random digits. And basically, it's someone has thrown a dice, numbered from 0 to 9, and wrote down their results. Truly random. And if you look at any one particular row, you can use that row to actually um, uh, generate random numbers that you can use to make decisions about who's going to be in your study and who's not. Um, basically, what you want to do is you make sure everybody in the population has the uh, numerical label that's the same length. So if I have 100 people in my that I need to make a sample from, 100 is a three-digit number. I need to assign every person in my group or every individual a three-digit number 001 up to 100 or if I don't want to do that I could actually use assign everyone a two-digit number if I did 00 to 99 then everyone will get a two-digit number but it still have 100 digits so you see the difference there I can I have two choices from 00 to 99 or from 001 to 100 to randomly select 100 people of some kind okay so we're going to take a look at a table and we'll see what that looks like Okay, so here's an example. Um, this is involving using line 130 from table P in the back of the book. And you can randomly pick that number, whichever row you want to use. 
And we're going to do this for to randomly select four hotels to use in some sort of study. Okay, so if you notice here, I have 28 hotels, and I've assigned each of the number, each of my two-digit number from 1 to 28. So you notice the 1 to 9 also needs to be two-digit number, so there's 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3. So here's my line 130. This is line 130. Here's what the numbers look like. I've got broke up in groups of five just so you can kind of um, separate them a little bit easier. And so every two-digit number, you break them up into two-digit numbers. So if you notice here, the first two numbers I see are 6 and 9, so that's the digit number 69. Then 0, 5, and then the next two-digit number is actually 1, 6, which is the number 16. So that's how I create this list of numbers as I take that random that line and make two digit numbers out of them. Okay? Then I go through and I pick the first five, I'm sorry, the first four hotels, first note, four, four numbers that will represent the hotels. So if you notice, 69 is the first two digit number. But remember, my hotels are only from 1 to 28, so I'm not going to use 69. However, 05 is in my hotel, so that's one number that I will use. So I will pick. The Beach Castle is one of my hotels for this study. 16 is also a number on there. So I will pick the Radisson as another hotel. 48, that's too big. I'm only going to numbers of 1 to 28. So 17 would be the next one, which would be the Ramada right next to the Radisson. 87, too big. Now notice 17 got picked again. Well, I'm not going to pick it. I, want, um, I can't use the same hotel twice. So I'm going to ignore that. 40 is too big, 95 is too big. Oh wow, 17 got showed up again. Again, I'm going to cancel that out. I'm only looking for the numbers 1 to 28 that I haven't already used before. So 84, 53, 40, 64, 89, 87 are all too big. Aha, here's the number 20 that would work. And so I'm going to use the C Club Hotel as my fourth and final hotel for my study. Please note if that if for whatever reason I couldn't use that last number, I would go to just go to the next line and continue from there and keep finding a two-digit number that I haven't used before. Okay, so one of the all big things that you want to be able to do in AP Stats is determine the difference between an observational study versus an experiment. Um, observations, we just observe, literally as it sounds. We don't try to make any changes. We don't try to impart anything. We just observe and we count what's happening. Experiments, on the other hand, we actually impart some sort of treatment, okay? So here's the big di difference here, is it imposes a treatment. We try to make some sort of change. We give one group a new aspirin. We give the other group a placebo. And we see if there's a difference between the two groups in terms of headaches, okay? An experiment, we're going to actually do something and see if there's an effect. Okay, those are usually um, when we want to determine cause and effect. We want to show that this new aspirin does a better job at curing headaches than the placebo does. Okay, observations, we're just going to observe them. We don't know, we can't prove cause and effect. Okay, one of the big problems is, with observations is confounding variables. Other factors that we are not aware of when we're just observing can alter our results, influence our results in such a way that we may say, you know what, it's, uh, uh, like in my example, it's the new aspirin that's causing it, when in reality it may be the fact that that group has a uh, lower stress level than the other group because of some factor we weren't aware of, and that's the reason why their, their headaches went down. Okay? Um, so, you, again, this is um, two definitions you need to become familiar with, a lurking variable and confounding variable. Well-designed experiments try to avoid confounding variable through the randomization. If we randomly assign our two, uh, everyone into one of two groups, one that takes the placebo, one that takes the new aspirin, we're going to hopefully balance out any confounding variables like the stress level between the two groups, and then we can say, well, if there's a difference between the two groups in terms of the headaches, we can say, oh, it's because of the new aspirin and not because of the stress level. This concludes this short video here. Reminder that you can stop and pause and replay it anytime you want. Make sure you have all the definitions down and added to your producing data notes worksheet. And make sure you bring it to class as we will be adding to it with several class activities over the next week, week or so.